Good afternoon, everybody. It's the Close of Business Gang, and we're really, really excited about today's guest. It's Dr. Steve Coonan. You've probably heard of him recently, if you hadn't already, because he just wrote a fantastic book. It's called Unsettled, and he's capturing quite a lot of attention, and I think it's because the book the book is obviously it's really thoughtful. We can't wait to talk about the book. But as you'll hear, Dr. Coonan's background includes so many aspects of life that really inform him on this discussion. He's a scientist by training uh, at both Caltech and MIT. He spent a lot of time at BP as their chief scientist. He worked as the Undersecretary for Science at the Department of Energy under President Obama. And since then, he's been teaching at NYU. And as you'll hear, he's been thinking quite a lot about all kinds of scientific issues, but particularly the climate discussion and his book is just a tour de force, helping all of us understand what is, I think, at some level, one of the most complicated challenges we've faced, but yet something that gets oversimplified all the time. And so, Dr. Coonan, we can't thank you enough for joining us. We're really, really excited about this. Oh, great. I'm happy to be here talking with you and, and your team. All right. Well, let's see what's happening in the markets. Mike Bradley, what do you got today? Yeah, Maynard, it's a pretty mixed screen today, a little bit red, but, you know, let's, let's give a review of what happened last week and kind of give an idea of what's going on today. It's, you know, last week, uh, Brent and, uh, and WTI prices were up uh, modestly, uh, NAFTA gas is up modestly, and the energy equities were kind of flattish and no real movement. And so, you know, you know, we're, we're sitting there uh, today uh, with energy is, is getting beat up a little bit, and the reason why that is is because, um, you know, Iran, Iranian, um, there's there's some stuff coming out of Vienna today about the U.S. and Iran getting closer to sort of a deal. And uh, what was interesting is Brent price got above seventy dollars today. We got as high as seventy and a quarter, just because fundamentals good, technicals are kicking in, and that really kind of took the bloom off the rose a little bit. Uh, it subsequently recovered. Uh, we ended at sixty seventy five for the day because. That on Russian envoy in Vienna walked that back his his statement and said that there's uh, instead of there being significant progress there's unresolved issues, and so you know the way we look at things right now is that this is going to continue to hang over the market until there's there's some sort of a deal. But I would say that we think if there's a deal that's likely going to cap the upside for crude going forward, but it's not going to be, uh, be a material risk to the downside. And as we said previously, either they put a million barrels on the water at some point before 20, you know, the end of 21, the market can accommodate and the market will still be drawing at those levels. So, you know, the headline sounds scary, but the reality is it's probably just going to limit the upside. It's not going to really, um, you know, be a big downside surprise. And the one last thing, and maybe Colin will talk about a little bit uh, later, is the IEA came out with their, you know, sort of their uh, outlook uh, to 2050 today. And, and the thing that was very interesting to me is they said in there that, that, you know, spending on all new oil and gas projects needs to end immediately. And, but in, in investing, in, you, know, you know, investments right now can, you know, in reservoirs that are there online can continue to, you know, continue to go. I think what that says to me is that was, that's providing Mike, framework. Uh, this was to make the 2050 net zero goal w what would be required, right? That was the headline? Yeah. Yeah, they're saying that, you know, we need to cap new oil and gas, all new oil and gas in 21. I mean, that just says that's a framework, in my opinion, for fossil fuel shortages uh, and price spikes. And so we'll see what happens. But that came out today. And so I think that was a big document. It was an interesting document. It's something people should read. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that had some influence on crude oil as well today. Yeah, I saw I had saw that the same reaction. Like, start hoarding oil and gas immediately. Uh, that looked nutty. Okay, Matt Portillo, uh, big day at TPH uh, in the note this morning. You guys initiated coverage on Ford and GM. Uh, tell us about that one in particular. Yeah, sure, Maynard. Um, so as we've kind of talked about, the process for the TPH research team is to start out with the macro and then follow with the micro. And the reason that we do that is we really want to understand the, the sector and industry that we're following and then work our way into company-specific coverage. So as you remember, back in January, 
Uh, we published a global automotive macro piece, which covered our views around gasoline demand. It covered our views around various different auto markets in the world that we continue to track. And it also talked about electrification trends. We actually recently updated that uh, outlook, which has um, gotten quite a bit of industry interest as well as client interest. Uh, but today's launch was quite exciting. We picked up Ford and GM. Uh, we are constructive on both stocks. I won't go into the company specifics, but if you have any interest in talking on those names, feel free to reach out to the, the research team and we'd be happy to walk you through that. I think the big picture takeaways for us are a fewfold. One, we are quite constructive on the automotive recovery in 2022. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. First and foremost, uh, 2020, obviously we had a big hit to demand and a big hit to production. And so naturally as we come out of the COVID lockdowns, there's pent up consumer demand. Uh, two, production's been impacted pretty materially, and that's leading to actually shortages uh, across the globe. Part of that was related to production downtime due to COVID, but it's also been related to the semi shortage. And I know we've talked a bit out about this on the program, uh, but essentially what that is doing is leading to higher prices and pricing power for the auto manufacturers, which is also leading to higher used car pricing, which is good for Ford and GM from a financial perspective. And then lastly, we think there's a big theme to play in the automotive sector around big tech meeting big, big auto. And uh, there's a lot of relationships and partnerships forming around autonomy uh, and connectivity. And we think that's going to be a huge business model for these companies going forward. Uh, and, and Ford and GM are well positioned. So I'll leave it there. But uh, there's initiation pieces on no both names. Uh, we'll be covering the broader global automotive sector, both on the traditional legacy OEM side as well as uh, looking at other opportunities within EVs, batteries, charging infrastructure. As we say at TPH, it's all energy all the time. And I think as these two worlds meld, uh, that's really gonna include transportation as part of our research process. All right, fantastic. Colin Fenton, what's on your mind today, brother? Well, I got something on tactical and something to lead in with our guest on the tactical side. Yesterday, natural gas and the prompt NYMEX contract uh, advanced through $3 per MMBTU for the first time in quite a while. That had proved to be formidable resistance. It was a 15 cent move on weather. And in the basis markets, we saw a general uplift following that. SoCal CityGate punched 40 cents higher to settle at 335. Dawn Ontario advanced by 15 cents to 332. Algonquin CityGate was up $1.25 to 325. In the options markets, the 25 Delta SKU now favors the calls in every NAT gas contract from August 21 onward. And in fact, in the March 22's call skew is almost 25 vol points. All of that supports the research house view. And then in the NYMEX forward curve, we saw some pretty uh, sharp tightening in backwardation. March, April 22 to 45 cents, that spread was 40 coming into the month. And the D-Stride Dece is now at 41 cents backwardated on seasonally comparable exposure. So plain English, it's getting bullish. On the uh, lead in to our guest, Remember uh, May 3rd, we had this article from the New York Times that reaching herd immunity is going to be difficult, if not impossible. And this really stood out. There is widespread consensus among scientists and public health experts that the herd immunity threshold is not attainable. It is already clear that the virus is changing too quickly. New variants are spreading too easily. Vaccination is proceeding too slowly for herd immunity to be within reach anytime soon. Now, if you're watching this, you know what happened. Uh, we, two days later, respectfully disagreed. Uh, our numbers show that herd immunity had already been achieved in the data uh, for vaccinations by May 10th, and that approximately 87% of US adults had received at least one dose or had natural immunity or had already had a bout of COVID. Uh, on the 13th, we had the CDC agree with us, not with the New York Times. And four days later, the governor of Massachusetts announced that even one of the most restrictive states would lift all remaining COVID-19 restrictions by May 29th. It's not to point fingers at anybody. It's not to, to say, I told you so. It's to remind us all that consensus is a questionable concept sometimes in science, particularly when it's mediated through journalism. And so when we get to this chart, which leads into today's discussion, here's something else you should be careful about. So here is a new definition of normal for weather presented on May 12th, 30 year average, 1991 to 2020, and predictably, it has all the scary red numbers that indicate how hot everything has gotten. But be careful, the chart is in Fahrenheit, not in Celsius, plus 1.5 Fahrenheit, not 1.5 Celsius. Remember that the argument is if we can contain temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, 
then all is basically okay with the world. We have won, we have succeeded, we have vanquished climate change. That number is about half to two thirds of the target. So to be intellectually honest in creating this chart, you shouldn't have it go to the extreme red, which you know has all sorts of reptilian connotations and also is associated with heat. Um, you really should be looking more to have some sort of neutral color, maybe getting to a yellow to signal that there's caution that you're approaching a threshold. But uh, we put that in there just to show some recent ripped from the headlines uh, examples of what our guest is going to talk about. And with that, Maynard, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Well, let's jump in with Dr. Kuhn. And again, uh, can I call you Steve? We did in the pregame. Absolutely. Game. Yeah, I'm, I'm Steve right. to everybody. All right. Well, Steve, uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, we're all excited. And, and as, I, as I mentioned to you, uh, last week when we got lucky enough to convince you to join us today is that uh, our rule is when authors join, uh, we read the book. And so we've all read the book. And let me just start off by saying um, it's, it's, it's awesome and it really goes into so much detail that, that shows you just how hard it is, how, how, the, how difficult these questions are, how much data there is, how much there is to take in, and, and you got to be really careful uh, simplifying what is a, a complicated topic. But let me just, so thank you for writing the book and thank you for joining us. Let's, let's jump in. How, how do you want to kick off the conversation, uh, Dr. Kuhn? Because there's so much we could cover here. Yeah, well, you know, I think the high level message is you often hear people, politicians, particularly talking about climate crisis, existential threat, um, <clears throat> imminent disaster, Sometimes you hear some scientists talk about that as well, or people who should know better, like Bill Gates, or my uh, good friend, Ernie Moniz, who used to be Secretary of Energy. And what I like to think when I hear them say that is a line from The Princess Bride. You keep using that word, the science, but I don't think it means what you think it means. And in fact, I would guess that most of those people have not read the official UN and US government reports let alone the underlying research literature. You know, the, uh, that's one thing that uh, is, in your, is in your report. And maybe we could just familiarize people uh, who are not totally familiar. Everybody's heard of the, the UN report. There's also a US report. You talk a lot about what is actually in those reports versus what gets reported. And you also talk about, particularly in the case of the US report, some of the stuff that made it through that maybe should have been scrubbed a, a little harder, but would you orient our audience to the two reports we're talking about and just, and then we'll go from there? So climate science is unusual among scientific fields because it has such societal import that every six or seven years, the UN issues a report that surveys, assesses, summarizes the scientific work that's gone on in, before since the last report. So as I said, about every six or seven years. The last UN report from the IPCC, which was called AR5, the fifth assessment report, came out in 2013. Uh, and there's another one due out expected in July of this year. Similarly, the US government has a congressional mandate to do a national climate assessment every four years. The fourth of those was issued in 2017 and 2018 in two parts, and the next one is expected in 2023. And these reports, again, are thought to be the gold standard for the science. In some ways they are, but in other ways, particularly the US reports, they're written more to persuade than they are to inform. And there are some, what I would call advisory malpractice that goes on when you read those reports in detail. Well, we were, uh, we, Colin alluded to it as we were, as we were just dialing in, but there was this, uh, this one graphic in the U.S. report that you used to really illustrate the point. And I, I will probably muddle the description but the graph suggests that we are reaching higher and higher temperatures uh, every year. Uh, but yeah. then as you dig into it, it's really a ratio of 
how many new highs we're hitting relative to how many new lows we're hitting. And when you disentangle the math, I think the punchline is the the truth is we're, we aren't having as many lows, uh, but the ratio, we aren't really having that much warmer days either. And in this graph is a really stark sort of thing that the world, I think in your, in your parlance, you said the world may be getting a more moderate climate, but, but it's not, you know, on fire. But yeah. let, let me stop there because this graph is, was sort of part and parcel of, of what you were talking about. Right. It, it's one of the chapters in the book. And in the history of my looking into it, it was one of the smoking guns for me that things were not being discussed honestly. The graph concerns the number of daily record highs and the number of daily record lows in about a thousand weather stations across the US. And the graph is um, the ratio, as you said, of the number of record highs to the number of record lows every year. And it's from about 1930 or 1940 up to the present. And what you see when you look at the graph, which is a figure in this National Climate Assessment of 2017, is that it zooms up in recent years and it sure looks like it's in red and it looks like everything's burning up. But when you dig into it, as I did, you discover that what's really happening is that the number of record highs and the number of record lows are both declining with time. And that's easy to understand because for the next record high, you have to beat the previous one, and that's pretty hard to do. It gets harder and harder as you go on. So both uh, numbers are going down, but the number of record lows is going down faster, and so the ratio is going up. Nevertheless, the graph is labeled in the original report by saying the number of record highs is increasing with time. Subsequently, they took it down from the web, but not all the websites. There are still some that have the original incorrect label. I and a colleague did a more proper analysis, and what we found is exactly what you said, namely the number of record highs across the U.S. has not increased at all in the last century, but the number of record lows has gone down over the last 50 years, so that the climate in many ways is getting milder uh, at the same time as it is warming slightly. So, so there's so many fascinating things uh, in the in the book. Um, everything from, you know, th the difference between climate and and weather, and you you know you 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 point to that. You you point to how data collection is changing and how it has changed and how people tend to, you know, focus on on different data sets when it tends to suit their purposes a little bit. And you also just talk about the modeling exercise around all this uh, which is which is daunting and then i i think lastly there, there's there's quite a lot where you discuss hurricanes and fires and all the things that people tend to attribute to warming that you know the data is um is tenuous i think maybe is the right description or maybe just not there sometimes but do, do you mind just talking about the data the data collection the data sets the, the modeling, just that whole meaty uh, weather versus yeah. climate. I think there's a lot, so much in there for people. So, so um, we, we can get into a little bit later some of the actual data about extreme weather events, which I think is interesting and quite contrary to what people have been led to believe. But let's just talk about the problem. The climate is defined as a long-term average, 30-year average, of the weather. And that means what happens today, next month, a year from now, isn't really relevant to the climate. It is the average over a couple decades, at least. Furthermore, we're looking for small changes. The average temperature of the globe has gone up by about one degree Celsius, or about two degrees Fahrenheit, over the last century or so. so pretty small changes compared to the day-to-day -day or seasonal variation in any one location. So we need long records and pretty precise observations 
to understand what's going on with the climate. Moreover, one of the most important parts of the climate is the ocean. The ocean has time scales that can last up to a thousand years. Uh, it changes much more slowly than the atmosphere, which changes over a couple of days as we see with the weather. And so climate really happens in many ways in the ocean. And of course, observing the ocean surface, first of all, which we can do these days with satellites, but can only do that for the last 50 years or so. And also observing the ocean at depth, which is even harder, and we can only really do for the last 10 or 15 years. So the data themselves are pretty incomplete. And then we get to the issue of the models. The models are used to understand how the climate system works and to project how it might change under human and natural influences going forward. And that's a grand computational challenge. We cut the ocean and the atmosphere up into hundreds of millions of rectangular boxes. We track how the air and humidity and winds move through those boxes, sometimes 10 minutes at a time. And there's a lot of assumptions that go on in that, even when we know the basic physics, because the boxes are typically 100 kilometers on a side, 60 miles, and lots of stuff happens, as you can see behind me in those Hudson Valley clouds, lots of things happen on much smaller scales than 60 miles. And so there are assumptions, the models don't, dis don't agree with one another, they sometimes agree with the observations, sometimes not. Uh, and so it's much more of an art than it is a science to model the climate. And when we take those models and we feed into them what might happen in the future in terms of emissions, aerosols, natural forces, we get some sense of what the climate might be, let's say, at the end of the century. But there are big uncertainty bars in all of that. You know, it reminds me of a headline that we saw last week in a uh, very prominent newspaper that goes to all of us that said, uh, the climate is clearly changing. Just look around. And I, I literally laughed out loud when I saw that, that, you know, the idea that a human being has a detector apparatus that fine, that somehow it can beat all the supercomputers in the world and is able to uh, get all those sigmas and all those means, you know, instantaneously. And that's part of the problem, right? You are appealing to somebody's emotional perspective and their memory. We all know how faulty all of our memories are. And I thought one, um, you know, thing that was really interesting about the book and something I appreciated was how you built it up layer by layer. You told the story about being in kindergarten and being, you know, fascinated by a thermometer and um, pointing out that Daniel Fahrenheit's first, you know, kind of modern thermometer only dated to 1714. We had the Galileo thermometers before then, of course, but you know, that spotty record got more and more and more precise. And here we are today, even with the best records, even with continuous monitoring from satellites, uh, all the, the supercomputers, and a really scary number that you, you emphasize is that these models can't agree on forward projections with a three degree Celsius band. And if the whole yeah. target is to try to get to two, and the error term in these models is that wide, um, anybody who, who plays with statistics like we do with real world consequences every single day, because we lose money if we make mistakes like that, um, appreciates the point you're making. So with all of that, because there's just so much in the book, and I realize we, we only have so much time, um, could you explain for the audience a little bit why it's important to talk about uh, measurements in Kelvin as opposed to Fahrenheit? I thought that was a really intuitive explanation you gave on the whole 1%, and it could also maybe get to some, some understanding in a very clear cut way about how sunlight warms the planet and then how we radiate heat back into right. space. And I liked your, your catch and release concept as opposed yeah. to trap. So yeah. I can sort of give you that as a setup. Okay, good. That's a good opening. Let me, let me try. Um, so, you know, you can ask as we do at the beginning of every serious climate course that people teach, is what's the temperature of the Earth? How come it is what it is, which is about 55 degrees Fahrenheit on average, of course, less at the poles and more at the equator. And the way in which that temperature is set is by saying that the Earth doesn't gain or lose any energy as time goes on. The energy coming into the Earth is the sunlight absorbed 
which we know pretty well. About 30% of the sunlight gets reflected, but 70% gets absorbed. And then the energy coming out of the Earth is the heat that the Earth radiates back into space as infrared radiation or heat. And if those two things were out of balance by even 1%, we would see it very quickly because the Earth would be heating up or cooling down, depending upon which way the balance was. Now, the Earth's atmosphere, mostly the water vapor, but also the carbon dioxide and a couple of other gases, intercept the heat as it's coming out of the Earth's surface, retard it, intercept it, catch and release, slow it down on the way back out to space. And some of it, when it gets slowed down, finds its way back to the surface and provides additional warming to the surface. That's the greenhouse effect, as it's called. Uh, and it raises the temperature from, um, I know it in Kelvin, and I'll tell you why in a minute, uh, about 255 Kelvin up to the current 288 uh, Kelvin. So it's a big effect, and it's what allows liquid water to exist on the Earth and so on. Now, what humans are doing is increasing the effectiveness of that interception by about 1%. And um, that is going to make the planet warmer. It's like making the blanket a little bit thicker that's covering you on a cold night. And people ask, how could that 1% have such a big effect? Well, if you measure the Earth's temperature with the scale, the temperature scale, Kelvin, that matters, the Earth's temperature is, as I said, 288. And so 1% of that is almost 3 degrees Kelvin or 3 degrees Celsius, which is a lot. And, and so it is quite simple, and I'm glad you got it in the book, to understand how such a small perturbation on the heat intercepting ability of the atmosphere can result in enough temperature rise to give us some cause for concern. Well, maybe maybe a quick follow up on that, you know, back to that concept of, of malpractice um, with the chart that you had previously mentioned, my understanding is the National Academy of Sciences did actually flag there was a problem with some of that description. And it's really telling that even with kind of the slap on the wrist, like you can't do that, we still had this tortuous creation of a ratio as opposed to what would be the far more natural chart, just show me a bar chart, how many highs and how many lows. And I think one other thing that you, you explain clearly in the book, but just to make sure the audience understands it, the way these records were calculated was successfully a running tab. So that if you had a record in 1980 and then 82 and 86, it counts as three as opposed to one for the full interval of time, which biases the chart towards the right as- Yes, as abs absolutely. And what's interesting, to stray away from the substance from it. And just by the way, I do of course show separately the highs and the lows in the book, which John Christie, my colleague calculated. Um, I can't do it, but John can. Um, that particular graph was actually inserted by the government after the National Academies review. We've got the back and forth between the academies and the, and the government. And so in many ways it escaped the academies uh, recognition, and I expect it would have been caught if uh, the government had played honestly. So that really, you know, that trust me as somebody who has a lot of experience in advising the government, and in, you know, for a couple of years I was in the government and and sought advice from experts. Um, that's just so wrong. That is just terrible. And there are other instances in that report, and in some cases in the IPCC, where you can see that they have buried things or they have truncated the record because the earlier decades didn't quite agree with what they wanted to say. Um, it's really just disgraceful. And I think the book is my attempt to circumvent all of that and get right from the uh, original papers or the reports in some cases, circumvent the summaries for policymakers, the media, the politicians, and just give people some sense of what the science actually says. I think, uh I think Stephen going through the book and I feel guilty calling you Steve because the book is so excellent. I need to call you Dr. Coonan. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we consider you a, a friend, but you, there was a great quote um, 
in your closing thoughts that I think maybe captures for, for people, at least for me, kind of what your message was. Because you, you do say we have man-made warming happening. That's clear. You say we have a lot of other things going on that are, then we're just beginning to measure. You know, you say that so much of what is attributed to global warming is not the evidence of global warming. You you point out how the media and politicians get carried away. But then I, re I really like this punchline, advocating that we make only low risk changes until we have a better understanding of why the climate is changing and how it might change in the future is a stance some might call waffling, but I'd prefer the terms realistic and prudent. So you're, I think that's the camp we often find ourselves in. It's like, hey, what do we really know before we get carried away changing stuff? Let's do stuff that we know helps. You point to methane leaks and natural gas pipelines and other things that are obvious we should fix. But but you're like, hey, because your other quote was, for me, the many certain downsides of mitigation outweigh the uncertain benefits. Do you mind just expanding on this? Well, I don't mean to try to conclude your work, but those really stuck out with us. Well, that's we good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad they, they, they got through. Um, look, I think the decision about what society should do about a changing climate and a changing under both human influences, natural influences, is ultimately a values decision. It's got to fold in risk tolerance, the need for energy versus the environment, uh, intergenerational equity, north-south equities around the globe. And those decisions express values and priorities but they have to be informed by what the science says about risks or non-risks and so on. And I've tried to give in the book again, an accurate understanding of what the science is, and then everybody can have a discussion based on their values. My values are no better than any other. In fact, my wife would say they're worse than everybody else's, but that's a different discussion. Um, and that's the kind of discussion we should be having. And as we think about, well, could you really reduce greenhouse gas emissions enough to make a difference? I think what both President Biden and Ambassador Kerry have acknowledged is what the US does, even if we could get to zero, would have little direct effect on human influences. You gotta get the rest of the world to come along. And when the rest of the world, 40% of the rest of the world does not have adequate energy, and the most convenient and reliable way to get that energy is fossil fuels, you have to ask the question, how's the rest of the world going to get the energy they need? And while people will mumble technology, and Bill Gates wrote a book about the kind of technologies we can develop, which is actually a pretty good book on the technology side, not very good on the climate side. Um, and nobody has an answer to that. All right? So that's why I'm a little bit, actually more than a little bit concerned about the proposed scope and pace of the energy transition in this city, uh, in this country. Um, yeah, maybe we should head in that direction, but let's make sure that the lights stay on and the uh, fuel is there, the mobility is there, uh, and not shoot ourselves in the foot. You have this, uh, there's, a, there's a number of times you make reference to um, uh, people saying the science and you say, let's go back to science, small s. Why do you think there is a, uh, a push to shut down the discussion and just start moving to solutions? Why, why do we, you talk a lot in the book about the media and politicians and NGOs and, and various constituents, as well as industries, be they oil and gas or renewables or others. You, you, you talk about contributors to the debate, but why can't we pause and debate this better? What What is the rush uh, to call this matter settled and not uh, discuss it? Can you elaborate on that for our I, audience? I, I, I think, you know, it's hard to get into people's heads, but uh, I can perhaps hypothesize that there are a couple of different motivations. Uh, one is people 
genuine belief, genuinely believe that the planet is in peril and we've got to do something or we're in real trouble. And okay, perhaps people do do that. Um, another certainly is the media. You know, as I talk about in the book, most of the extreme weather events don't show much happening. But if I'm a news person, and particularly if I'm a climate reporter who needs to get my stories on the front page, uh, I'm going to find the worst weather disasters I can and keep talking about climate uh, in um, what I report. And the politicians, I, there's a lovely line I use in the book from H.L. Mencken, who was a journalist and commentator in the early part of the 20th century. And I won't get it exactly right, but the gist of it is that the purpose of practical politics is to keep the public alarmed by a series of hobgoblins, mostly imaginary, et cetera, et cetera, so that the government can do something. And so you know, the politicians, if they said, the climate's not doing much, uh, let's turn to other matters. I wish they would, because we've got so many other matters in this country to deal with, which you can probably articulate better than I. Um, but the climate seems to be all embracing Let's reform the infrastructure. Uh, let's deal with social justice, unemployment, manufacturing. Uh, you can go on and on, all on the umbrella of climate. And, you know, I can't blame the politicians for that. But when they start invoking the science um, and tarnishing, if you like, the reputation of science by attributing falsehoods to it, then uh, that's where I start to get really mad. Well, can I just throw in one more comment? Please. Colin and Mike are going to come off the bench here. Sorry, I get so excited. But you say in your book, like when you wrote, before you wrote the book, you wrote a number of op-eds, right? You would share your thoughts. And and you have in the book that your science friends would say to you, like, oh, boy, I really agree with you. You know, I wouldn't have said that in the in such a high-profile way. Why, why did, you know, they... So it's just sad that people aren't just being more open and honest. How do we how do we encourage people to be more intellectually I, yeah. honest? So, so let me just give you one more example like that. Right, that um, a lot of people have staked their careers and reputations on catastrophic human influences on the climate. We now have schools. My my alma mater, MIT. Uh, Columbia University, they've all started major climate efforts. And I think they've gotten so far out on a limb, it's going to be difficult for them to climb down. I would say that's true of the uh, Democratic Party as well. Uh, but um, it's a lot easier for politicians to climb down because everybody forgets what they said in a couple of months. Um, how, how do we get out of that? I think sunshine is the best disinfectant. Uh, I've tried to, you know, open up the curtain a bit in the book. Uh, what I hope is that people will read the book and see some of the things that are in the reports and say, gee, I didn't know that. And maybe turn to their scientific friends or advisors if they're in the government or corporate world and say, how come I didn't know that? How come you didn't tell me that? And what else are you not telling me? And maybe that's the start of opening up a little bit. I, th I think, if I can go on for just a second, I think there's another trend underway that may play into a greater honesty in portraying the science. While this was all an academic debate up until a few years ago, most people didn't care. Uh, it didn't matter very much. But now that this administration and governments in Europe are starting to put in plans and even to implement plans that directly affect people's lives, whether it's the cost of electricity or the ability to buy an internal combustion engine, uh, people are going to start to question more closely the scientific motivations and the need to go at the kind of pace and scale that's being proposed. So I think that's also favorable to a closer scrutiny of what's going on. Steve, I, I think what's really interesting to me is that if you ask most people, would they basically trust the weatherman's forecast five, five days out? Most people would probably say, no way in hell. 
But you ask them to basically trust something that's 20, 30, 40 years out, they're kind of falling in line like uh, like I've never seen. And, and so I guess my question is, and I think a lot of that is probably social media. The advent of social media here over the last couple of years has, has made it so you can really kind of throw some stories out there that you really can't debunk, you know, maybe some, some thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's far enough away that you can believe anything and not really suffer any consequences for it. Um, but as I said, as people start to suffer consequences, trying to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to see a greater scrutiny. But let me, you know, your, your analogy with the weather and the climate is maybe not quite right. And let me try to uh, go through something I, I have in the book. Um, if you try to describe with partial differential equations and computer models, the bubbling uh, of water in a boiling pot of water, you really have a hard time doing that in detail. It's chaotic, uh, multiple scales and so on. It's, it's very difficult. In fact, we can't do it to this day. On the other hand, if you try to describe how the average level of the water would go down as the pot boils away, you can predict that with fair confidence. And so the predictions of the climate are like predicting that average over a long time and not the detailed ups and downs of the weather. But even with that, it's really difficult because there are these feedbacks going on that amplify the effect of greenhouse gases that we don't really have a good handle on. And also there are long-term cycles of 60, 70 years or more in the climate that we can't reproduce in the models. And without those cycles, you don't really know what the phase, the amplitude is uh, of the cycle. And, and hence, you can think it's going up today because of greenhouse gases, but it's really going up because of one of these cycles. And we don't have a really good handle on that yet. Yeah, that was such a great example in the book. And I, if I remember right around that part of the book, you also talked about uh, aerosols. And so there's this concept that runs through the book of we, we have more warming as a concept, we also have less cooling as a concept. And aerosols are something, just to be totally honest, we don't fully understand as well as we would like to understand in terms of their role in this complex system. Could you talk a little bit yeah. about that as maybe a window to help the audience sort of understand, you know, it's okay to admit in science you don't understand something. Like real yeah. scientists yeah. do that. Yeah. That's why Absolutely. they like doing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right. That's, that's why you do science is to right. try to understand those things. That's where the joy is when you finally do understand. And then it's the greatest feeling in the world when you do. Um, humans influence the climate at the level of about a percent, as we discussed before. And there are two main classes of influence. One is the greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere, as we talk about in the book. Methane is another greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide. All of them exert a warming influence of about a percent, percent and a half on the planet on average. Counteracting that is uh, aerosol emissions, dirty coal, if you like, um, the, the brown clouds and so on, because they increase the reflectivity of the planet, reflect a little more sunlight, and so uh, cool the planet. And the net effect is the balance between those two and results in a net warming of about half of what uh, the greenhouse gases do. The problem with the aerosols is not only do they reflect directly, but they induce the formation of clouds. Uh, if you've ever seen ship tracks, for example, from a satellite, when you have a, a fossil fueled ship steaming along and you go down on a satellite, you see a big cloud behind it, a stream of, of white uh, that extends for miles. And that's because the um, aerosols in the exhaust nucleate uh, clouds. And you see this. And the damnable thing is we don't really understand that process very well. And so the trade-off or the balance between the warming of the greenhouse gases, the cooling of the aerosols is pretty uncertain. And that accounts for a good deal of the uncertainty in the models. So Dr. Coonan, one of the things, uh, as Colin said, there's so much in there that was so much fun. I, I wish we could do a two hour show with you. 
Um, and, and just as an aside, we're going to make a huge uh, purchase of your book and give them away at our upcoming energy conference on June 10th. So we can't wait to, uh, you know, to let more people facilitate uh, more people seeing your stuff. But as I understand it, the, the, but the book is like selling like crazy. So um, it's fantastic. But um, there was an interesting thing in the data. I think it, and I'll mess up these years, but basically we had a warming period in the early part of the century. And then I think we had about 40 years of cooling from like 40 to 80. And then from 1980 on, we've had warming again. And that really uh, makes you think because it was, um, I think your stat is at the beginning of the century, we had one fifth the amount of people in the world that we have today. So here you have this uh, almost like a control set of activity where we had warming, but we didn't have all the the human uh, effects that we have today. So it's a, it's a really, all this data is really fascinating. And the other one was the mini ice age, which I'll screw that up, but that was like 400 years of, of cooling. Uh, but anyway, would you talk about some of those temperature observations yeah. and oscillations? So, so, so we're talking about the average temperature of the globe, which is a you know, a theoretical concept, or well, it's an observational concept. It's not the temperature anybody feels anywhere, but it's kind of how much the temperature has changed average over the globe uh, and how it's changed with time. And we had the phenomenon called the Little Ice Age, uh, the depths of which were about 1600, 1700. Uh, it was warmer before that, the so-called medieval warming period, medieval warm period. And um, the globe has been warming since the Little Ice Age. It was the Little Ice Age was declared over in about 1825 or so, um, and we've been warming up by about a degree uh, since the depths of the Little Ice Age. We don't understand really what caused it. There's still a little bit of dispute about whether it was a global phenomenon or just the northern hemisphere or even just northern Europe. Um, but if you look at the modern instrumental record from about 1880 onward, where we had good thermometers covering uh, a lot of the globe. What you see is that it was warming from about 1910 to 1940. And then as you said, it actually went down from 1940 to 1970 or 75. And then it went up again. And if you look at that, and then you realize that throughout that whole time, greenhouse gases were accumulating in the atmosphere and exerting a growing warming influence. But the temperature went down actually for some decades. Then you realize there's gotta be a lot more going on simply than carbon dioxide is warming the planet. And that a lot more going on is the aerosols in part that we talked about. But more importantly, I think people think for that uh, period of decreasing temperature, it's these natural cycles. They have names, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, the Pacific decadal oscillation, and so on. And you'd better have those in your model with the right frequency and right timing. Uh, otherwise, you're going to misattribute temperature variations to greenhouse gases, when in fact, it's just the Earth going through natural cycles. So that's another uncertainty, if you like, in the modeling and, and how we understand what's going on. Steve, you mentioned uh, partial differential equations, and I was, I was thinking of when our world uh, rated your world, the world of physics, and tried to apply the models of physics to economic markets, which are also highly complex systems. And famously, there was a hedge fund in 1998, long-term capital management, which included a Nobel Prize winner, who used these models, and lo and behold, they did not accurately predict the behavior of human beings. And it basically came down to the idea that the model said it was impossible for the sovereign government of Russia to default on its debt, and you will not be surprised that human beings sometimes default on their debt. Yeah. So yeah. that's a, a tee up to sort of, I, I think, get to another thing you talk about in the book, which is do not fall in love with complex models. Do not uh, reify and revere complex models just because they are complex. What our world, the world of energy, the world of finance and banking learned is sometimes what's far better is to imagine a world you think is impossible and think about how you might get there and do a scenario analysis. And you talk a little bit about 
The military does that. And all sorts of folks who deal with real threats all the time do that. How do you think of Team Red and you know this idea of, of using scenario analysis to surface ideas that may be low probability, but wholly consequential if they did in fact yeah. come yeah. um, I am mystified at why we don't do a more rigorous scrub, red team analysis, if you like, of what we know and don't know about the climate. In fields of national security, which I know pretty well, particularly the modeling of nuclear weapons, it's important to maintain the safety and efficacy of the stockpile. Uh, in other you know, combat situations where you do simulations and models, uh, in high-risk engineering situations where you're trying to put a rover on Mars, you always get a team of adversarial experts who are charged with saying, what's wrong with this? What could go wrong? And it amazes me that we have not done that in climate, despite it being labeled a national security issue by the uh, administrations. Um, I would hope that one can get the ear of some sensible people in the Pentagon and uh, have that kind of study. I know a number of people who would be both competent and interested to undertake that. And my guess is that they will find some surprises that uh, have not been realized before. And maybe the present administration will not be too happy with what they find. But in fact, you know, the president has said we should live in a world of facts and not make them up. So we'll see uh, just how uh, much he wants to adhere to that statement. Where I thought you were going, and I think is an interesting thing for us to talk about, is for all of the uncertainties and problems in the assessment reports, they do make predictions about the economic impact of warming. And that, to me, is one of the big surprises. And maybe it's worth spending a couple minutes on that, if you would like. You know, it's funny you should yeah. mention that. I happened to read the Massachusetts uh, State Energy Plan for the year 2030 over the weekend, as you do. And um, <laughs> the, uh, the thing that's really struck out at me and what I learned for the first time is the difference in price for a heat pump uh, that is air-based as opposed to ground-based. Nowhere in that document is it revealed that the ground-based geothermal heat pump is five times more expensive than the air pump. And I happen to then look up, since I am in Wellesley, Massachusetts right now, uh, what is a zone six capability for uh, a heat pump that's air versus ground? And you'll not be surprised to hear that cold Massachusetts has to use the ground one, not the, the air one. And I think that, you know, it gets back to your point of, was that a deliberate omission? I mean, presumably the person who was recommending the, the heat pumps knows a lot about heat pumps. And, you know, I, I, I don't really have a question. It's just sort of to, to validate what you just said, that once we start having 332 million Americans, 7.8 billion human beings surrender some amount of trust to scientists and policymakers that we're going to actually be rational about this. You admit over and over again, we all know that human beings have an impact on ecosystems. Um, one of the other examples you gave was that that map of the United States where Los Angeles and New York have uh, elevated heat. And you pointed out, you know, it might have something to do with the fact that the population of New York went from 3.4 million to 8.7 million and maybe 5 million more people sitting in that small yeah. island and uh, the surrounding yeah. area had something to do with it. That was uh, another, you know, let me be polite and call it misrepresentation by the Washington Post that I cover in, in the book. But let me say a word about the economic impact since you all are um, in the business world. Um, if you look at the, both the official UN report and the uh, federal government's national climate assessment, they both say that the impact of a warming of up to six degrees Celsius, which is four times the one and a half degrees that Paris is trying to uh, achieve, would have a minimal economic impact on either the globe or the US in 2100, about 4%. So and to be clear, it still goes up. 
it's it's going percent. up. It's just going to go up a little more slowly, right? Uh, or a little bit delayed, right? So if the economy is growing at two percent a year, which for the U.S. is maybe a, a reasonable number, the globe will be growing faster than that. A four percent hit is equivalent to a delay of two years of growth, seventy years from now or eighty years from now. Nobody can predict the economy with that kind of fidelity. And and as the report says that there are many other more important influences, regulation, technology, um, trade. Uh, and so it's nuts to say that the climate changes are going to crash the economy. They're just not. Nevertheless, when those reports came out, the headlines in uh, even the Wall Street Journal, but um, certainly the Guardian, the New York Times, economic disaster predicted if we don't do something. It's just, it's so dishonest. It really forced me. You know what I think too, uh, Stephen, and maybe I can't prove this, but I'll throw it out there, is we've been talking about inflation quite a bit around this firm for, for a bit of time here. And it just seems like this climate change stuff is, is, is leading to a bunch of stuff that's very, very expensive. The average person can't afford it, and it's and it's inflationary to me. Um, any thoughts on that? And one last uh, thought for me is, I mean, what what's been the feedback uh, to the book up to this point in time? Oh, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying not to have a selection bias, but by and large, the comments I see on Amazon or on uh, the Wall Street Journal pieces have been very positive. On the other hand, um, I was fact checked as. Uh, I discussed in a Wall Street Journal op-ed piece on Monday. Uh, I was fact-checked by a, a gang of uh, consensus scientists, and uh, it was, in my opinion, pretty disgraceful what they said and what they did. And I've put up a, a post that I think effectively rebuts uh, the criticisms. They, they in fact, fact-checked the book without ever having read it. Uh, but just on the basis of a review that appeared in the Wall Street Journal, what kind of science is that? Okay, what kind of integrity is that? Come on. I mean, I'm happy for people to criticize what I wrote, but at least read it before you do. Well, I was going to say, uh, I don't know if you want to hit on that inflation question, but I, I, it, it does appear we're doing a lot of things without thinking through the cost, or at least thinking about the costs and the and the benefits. Are you optimistic we're going to return to a little more cost benefit in how we think about things? Yeah, I, I think the system is going to have to get back to that because if people start suffering uh, hardship because of the kind of energy transformation we are hurrying through, then people are going to ask, why are we doing all this? And uh, hopefully that's going to lead to a more rigorous look at the science and the cost benefit. Uh, in the U.S. relative to the rest of the world. Well, the book is unsettled. Uh, the feeling is more settled after you read it because you just realize uh, this is a complicated subject. And more importantly, you get excited about people just being open, honest, candid, asking questions throwing it out there like you have. And so I, I think we all just owe you an immense thank you for wading into all this and because it's an incredible amount of work uh, and it's in, inspiring to see somebody jumping in and with all your knowledge and doing what you've done. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, pleasure talking with you. You know, it, it has been a labor of love uh, and a labor of conscience in some ways. So my goal is just give people more information not try to persuade them. And I'm glad that uh, that seems to have happened in talking to you all. Well, we can't wait to hear all the feedback from this discussion. And we can't wait to hand out a lot of your books at our conference. Yeah. And we're pleased to have you as a friend. So you call us anytime we can help you. Okay, I will do that. Thank you much. Thank you, Steve.